So a woman just took a pregnancy test and she finds out she's pregnant. She's concerned because she doesn't know when she fell pregnant because she slept with so many guys. You, as a physician, are expected to be able to know the gestational age and be able to estimate the estimated date of delivery. After the end of this lecture, I guess you'll know exactly what to do. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is on my YouTube channel where we'll look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at pregnancy dating, revolving around estimation of gestational age as well as estimation of the estimated date of delivery. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So remember that the earliest sign of pregnancy is actually a missed menstrual period. Remember, it's a missed menstrual period, not really vomiting as all oh, African parents think that if a girl child of reproductive age starts vomiting a lot, then they start looking at you in a weird uh, way. There was one time when I fell sick and I was actually vomiting so much and I actually thought I was pregnant. No, I'm just joking. It's banter. So... Remember that for sexually active women who are actually of reproductive age, those that have a regular menstrual period, by regular it means that each and every single day it's 28 days of, or each and every single week rather, or month is 28 days. And those that have a regular period between more than one week late, we presume that they are pregnant. So if their period is delayed by one week and you know that this person has regular periods, after every 28 days, we assume that they're pregnant. So remember that the pregnancy is going to be considered to last roughly about 266 days from the time of conception. Remember the time of conception is where the egg and the sperm actually meet together. Then 280 days from the first day of the last menstrual period. So this actually assumes several things. One assumption that we make is that the cycle is going to be lasting 28 days on an average. That's the first assumption that we make. The second assumption is that this cycle is going to be regular. It, you don't have any periods that are missed in between and it's a regular cycle. The third assumption is that you're not taking any contraceptive pills. You're not taking any uh, birth control. So we make these three assumptions. And once we make these three assumptions, we assume that the pregnancy is going to be lasting 280 days from the first day of the last menstrual period and 266 days from the time of conception. So remember that the delivery is going to be estimated based on the last menstrual period. And this can actually be up to two weeks earlier or one week later. So we should give an estimated date of delivery that's either two weeks in between the range of two weeks before the actual date, one week after the actual date. You shall see this. I'll explain this a lot towards the end of the lecture. Remember that if anyone delivers before 37 weeks of gestation, you call this as preterm. If, everyone, if anyone delivers after 42 weeks of gestation, it's known as post-term. So now, remember that we have to estimate the gestational age of the pregnancy. This is very important to the mother because the mother wants to know when exactly she's going to expect her baby to be born. And for the healthcare workers and the providers, it actually provides various important screening times for doing certain tests, certain assessments that need to be done in the pregnancy. For example, after 20 weeks of uh, gestation, you expect that you shouldn't be screening this woman for any hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, gestational diabetes that's going to be associated with pregnancy. So this is why it's very important that you actually know the gestational age. And also it helps with planning the delivery and when you expect this woman to get into labor. So what are some of the methods of estimating gestational age? We divide them predominantly into three main groups. We have based on the menstrual history. So this can be using the dates, using the last normal, the first day of the last normal menstrual period. Then that's assuming if the menstrual periods are regular and each are lasting 28 days and ovulation is happening on the 14th day. Then you can also use the date of quickening. I'll, I'll define what quickening is very, very shortly. You can do this by clinical examination, by the bookings in physiofundal height, the time when they come to booking for the first time, and you measure this in physiofundal height. Although this is not so accurate, and based on the gestational age, 
we shall see that it's not as accurate as the other methods of determining this. Then we have ultrasound. And remember that an early trimester ultrasound scan is actually the most accurate of the three methods. So if you're asked in the exam, if you're asked on your MCQs, the most accurate way to determine gestational age is an early trimester ultrasound scan. I put some scans inside this lecture to actually give you practical examples of this and how to do this. So the first two, which are the menstrual history and the clinical exam, are going to have some considerable amount of error because with the dates, remember that ovulation doesn't always happen on day 14. It's not always fixed in every single woman. It may vary on different cycles and women may have different cycles in different months and in different individuals have different cycles. So there is that room for error. Date of quickening, same thing. It, it tends to vary among not only paras women, it tends to vary among multi paras women. So it's not really a reliable thing. Symphysio fundo height, just like the other two methods, also is not so reliable. But if you have the ultrasound scan, then that's a quite reliable thing. So if you actually combine the ultrasound scan and the dates from the LMP, then it can actually give you a quite an accurate date or estimation of the gestational age and you can even figure out the expected date of delivery. So remember that the date of the first documented positive pregnancy test and that beta human chorionic gonadotropin level can actually help ascertain the minimal gestational age. I'll talk about this a bit later on in the same lecture. So remember that the importance of pregnancy dating, like I told, told you, is it's very important and it's critical for management of certain things. Because at a certain age, suppose someone develops a complication that requires them to give birth. And let's say for that maybe around 29 weeks, you know that you want to administer steroids to help further mature the lungs. But if the pregnancy is not really viable, let's say maybe it's at 18 weeks, then you're already not going to give steroids because there is no benefit. Then you would also it will also help you in conservative management versus early delivery or maybe even post-term induction of labor. So you shall see a lot of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the ACOG, this is pretty much a, a very big institute that actually governs a lot of the practices, a lot of the protocols that we use worldwide. So remember that they are going to be recommending that an ultrasound measurement should be done in the first trimester up until the 13th week, six days. So 13 weeks, six days of gestation. Once you do a scan between those weeks, it's actually the most accurate method of establishing or confirming the gestational age. And as soon as you have the data from the LMP and as well as the data from the first accurate ultrasound scan or both of them, then you can actually calculate the gestational age, which I'll show you how to do. You can calculate the estimated date of delivery or the EDD, which I will show you how to do. So here are some terms that you really need to note. So when you talk about quickening, this is just simply the date where the mother feels the first fetal movements. So this is actually an unreliable method of determining gestational age because like I said it varies among different women. Then you may have gestational age which is also referred to as the menstrual age which is pretty much the length of the pregnancy after the first day of the last menstrual period. So this is going to be expressed in weeks and days. Then you have conceptual age or conception age or which is the true fetal age. So do not confuse this with gestational age. So this is the length of the pregnancy from the time of conception, from the time the pregnancy is conceived. Then delivery after 37 weeks is termed, actually delivery before 37 weeks is termed preterm. Delivery after 42 weeks is going to be uh, post-term. Delivery within these 37 to 42 weeks is going to be a term delivery. And remember, estimation of gestational age is done predominantly by three main ways. So you have your menstrual history, which is using the date dates using the last menstrual period, date of quickening, the clinical examination, which is using the symphysiofundal height, and of course the ultrasound scan. An early trimester ultrasound scan is the most accurate of the three. So we'll begin with the menstrual history. So remember that here we're going to be needing information of the date of the last menstrual period. Now with this method, we assume quite a number of things. The first assumption that we make is that the cycle is going to be regular. The second assumption that we make is that Ovulation and conception is actually happening on day 14. And the third assumption that we make is that the patient is not on any oral contraceptive pills, nor do they have any condition that's going to be affecting their menstrual cycle. So this method actually has some disadvantages. One disadvantage is that the time of ovulation, like I said, varies among different cycles in an individual. It also varies among different cycles from one person to another. And about 10 to 45% of the women actually don't even know their last menstrual period. They're not even sure about their dates. And 18% of them 
have certain dates, but they have significant differences between the menstrual and the ultrasound dates. Then remember, this is not accurate in women that have oligo ovulation, like for example, those that have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And this method cannot be used for those individuals that are on oral contraceptive pills, on individuals that are taking long acting progestins and so it's because in this patients, the last menstrual period has no relation to the ovulation. And so we don't use these methods in these individuals. So remember, once you use this method, we often tend to overestimate because of the same assumptions that we're making, we tend to overestimate. So it has a 95% confidence interval of about minus 27 to nine days. So this is a very huge variation. So confidence interval, here's a rule of thumb, it's it's... I know it may be strange for some of you because it may be the first time you're hearing it. So think of it like this. The smaller the range of this confidence interval, the more accurate the result. So if someone has a confidence in interval of minus 3 to 3, that's a, a smaller range compared to minus 27 to positive 9 days. So it means that's a huge range. It means that it's not so accurate. So the smaller the number, the more accurate. That's like the simplest way I can actually explain it. So as you can see, this is not a so accurate way of doing things. But of course, it's a practical way. And this is one of the common methods that we're going to be using in the hospital. Then you can sometimes use the date of the pregnancy test to actually estimate what is referred to as the minimum gestational age. And this actually also should depend on the sensitivity of the test. So I'll give you an example. Suppose someone thinks they're pregnant, right? And it's been four weeks since they have had sexual intercourse. They decide to take the pregnancy test after four weeks. And the test is actually known to return a positive result within one week of conception. So we're assuming that conception has already happened. And so what's the minimum conception age? It's going to be five weeks, meaning the four weeks that has already happened plus the extra week that this uh, pregnancy test actually takes to detect the pregnancy. So... It's going to be five weeks and for the gestational age is going to be the five weeks plus two, which is seven weeks of the amenorrhea. So it means the gestational age will be seven weeks. The minimum conception age will be five weeks. But of course, in practice, I haven't seen this being used much more commonly. So remember that when you're using assisted reproduction techniques, remember you have artificial insemination and you may sometimes implant already fertilized ovum. Uh, or already fertilized egg in the directly into the uterus. Sometimes you may actually uh, deposit sperms into the uterus. So depending on the different types of techniques that I use, different methods are used. So the gestation age of a pregnancy is actually going to be calculated from the time the embryo is actually um, placed and the conception date may actually be delayed for a few days because the pregnancy is actually result from actually in pregnancies that result from intrauterine insemination the, the conception date may be much further then for those that are using ovulation induction agents the gestational age is actually calculated from the day of human chorionic gonadotrophin administration so we also can use the quickening date, but we rarely use that now. So this is the perception of the fetal movements. So remember that this is a very, very late, not really a very late, but relatively late sign of pregnancy. It's going to be occurring around 19 to 21 weeks of gestation. And this is going to be in naliparous women. In multiparous women, it's going to be in about 17 to 19 weeks of gestation. Now, because now we have a lot of pregnancy tests around on the market, we have ultrasounds, the date of quickening actually is often used to, well, previously it was actually often used to uh, confirm a suspected pregnancy, but now it's of no diagnostic value. Then you may have a clinical examination where you use the size of the uterus, which can be actually assessed by a pelvic examination or an abdominal examination. Now, this has some disadvantages because the size of the uterus may be unduly large in certain conditions like multiple pregnancies, uterine fibroids, or even a full bladder. So this may actually be leading to misleading to the physician. So usually we take a tape measure of the symphysiofundal height, and this is useful up to about 28 to 30 weeks of gestation. And beyond this, this actually becomes quite inaccurate for dating the pregnancy. Then ultrasound assessment, like I said, is the gold standard. 
So this is actually the most accurate technique of estimating gestational age. So most pregnant women are actually going to be having a first trimester, trimester scan followed by a detailed scan which is going to be looking for anomalies in the second trimester. So according to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, so if you do an ultrasound that confirms or revises the estimated date of delivery, then that's good. But if you don't do this before 22 weeks, then we consider that the pregnancy is actually suboptimally dated. So remember that the ultrasound can also detect multiple pregnancies, it can detect fetal anomalies, it can actually even identify placenta previa. So let's go into details of what we actually look at on these particular scans that will help us determine the gestational age. So in the early first trimester scan, remember that you're not going to be, if the scan is done quite early, you're not going to be seeing any structures in the gestational sac. So what we actually use to estimate the gestational age is actually the diameter of the sac. So there are different formulae out there that are going to be used, but I'll give you the common things that are commonly used. So we can use what is known as the mean sac diameter by calculating the mean of the three sac diameters. And then of course, this is going to be determined by consulting a table. There's a table that is going to be correlating the size of the diameter to the gestational age. Alternatively, you can say that you can take the sac, the size of the sac in millimeters, then you add 30 to it. This gives you the gestational age in days. So for example, this is hypothetically speaking, the sac is about, let's say, six centimeters. So six centimeters plus six centimeters in millimeters is about 60 millimeters. Then 60 millimeters plus 30 is gives you 90. So it's going to be 90 days gestational age. So by the time the embryo actually becomes visible on ultrasound, the sac diameter is no longer an accurate measure of the gestational age. So if there is no cardiac activity that is detected, but the embryo is not measured by the gestational um is not measured by then the gestational age by the ultrasound, then the gestational age, Jesus Christ, then the gestational age is five point five to about six weeks. And remember that in the first trimester, we do calculate something that is referred to as the crown ramp length. I'll show you a picture in the next slide. So this is actually the longest demonstrable length of the embryo or the fetus, excluding the limbs and the yolk sac. So it's pretty much the from the crown of the head to the rump, the bottom half of the the fetus or the embryo. And then you correlate this to the gestational age. And remember that this is actually an excellent way to actually determine the gestational age approximately up to 12 weeks of amenorrhea. And at this stage, you can't tell the sex of the child. You can't tell any racial differences. And yes, you can actually tell the differences in the races based on ultrasound. And some maternal characteristics uh, can be seen. For example, age and smoking may have significant effect beyond 10 weeks of gestation. So the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval of the gestational age estimation in the first trimester is about plus or minus six days. Notice the difference between us using the LMP, which was minus 27, <coughs> excuse me, minus 27 to about nine um, days. But then this is now six plus or minus six days. So the most accurate scans are actually done after between seven to 10 weeks of amenorrhea. So here's the formula that we use. So the gestational age in weeks is going to be equal to minus 0 0.0007 multiplied by the crown rump length in millimeters multiplied by two plus 0 0.1584 multiplied by the crown rump length plus 5.2876. And remember that once we do a transabdominal ultrasound where the probe is put across the abdomen, across the pelvis, this actually underestimates the gestational age by about an average of 1.6 days compared to a transvaginal ultrasound, which is actually much more accurate in determining this. In twin pregnancies, we take the crown rump pregnancy of the crown lump, the crown rump length of the smaller fetus. Then this is actually a much more accurate way of determining the gestational age in multiple pregnancies. We can also measure what is known as the biparietal diameter, which is the diameter from one parietal bone to the other parietal bone, the largest diameter between the parietal bones. Then this is going to be measured between 9 to 13 weeks of gestation, and this has actually been recently shown to be at least as accurate as measuring the crown rump length uh, with a smaller random errors being present. So here is an example of what I was talking about. 
So here's the fetus over here. So I think I can just zoom this so that you can see this clear, clearly on your screen. So as you can see, you can see this asterisk here. So that's the crown of the of the fetus. This is the rump of the fetus. Of course, this uh, is within the uterine cavity. So this length from here to here is about 6.27 centimeters. So if we were to actually get the gestational age remember we have to change this to millimeters so this is going to become 62.7 so minus 0 0.007 multiplied by 62.7 by 2 plus that that once you do the calculation you get 15.1 weeks so it's about 15 weeks gestational age you don't really need to know these formulae and how to calculate them. No one at this stage is going to ask you to calculate this based on the gestational age. If they did, they would give you the formulae and they would give you this information based on the ultrasound. Then once we do an ultrasound in the second trimester, remember that the fetal biometry in the second trimester can actually be accept acceptably accurate in estimating the gestational age from 12 to about 22 weeks of amenorrhea. And studies have actually shown that at 12 to 14 weeks gestation, once we do a scan at this, it's almost as good as doing a scan after 14 weeks. But the best parameters that we're actually going to be looking at are the biparietal diameter and the head circumference, which are virtually linear in relation to the gestational age. So as they get, the gestational age gets bigger, the diameters also and the head circumference also increase. Remember that the femur length can also be used and this actually is nearly as accurate as the head measurements and we can actually see some differences between different races when you look at the length of the femur but there is no significant difference in the head circumference among different races. And remember that the gestational age can be determined by the biparietal diameter and the head circumference with a 95% confidence interval of about plus or minus eight days. So how do we calculate this we say 39.1 plus 2.1 multiplied by the biparietal diameter in millimeters this should be in millimeters then gives you this gives you the gestational age in days so here's an example of a head as you can see here the diameters that are there although there this was the plus so as you can see there are some markings that you can see from here to somewhere here and this is actually the head of twin two. So this was a multiple uh, gestation pregnancy. As you can see, they even give you the area there and I guess the perimeter of the entire thing. And this is the view of the femur. So this is the femur. So from here to here is the femur length. So this whitish thing that you can see here is the femur. So this is about 4.90 centimeters. This is of course in twin two as well. Then we can also do an ultrasound in the third trimester. So the fetal biometry in the third trimester is actually sub subject to a much greater individual size variations than those in the second trimester. As we can see, as we're moving towards term pregnancies, there's a huge variation in the different sizes because different individuals are born with different sizes of body parts. Then the accuracy of the gestational age assess assessment is actually reduced considerably and actually has a confidence interval of about plus or minus three weeks. And remember that the confirmation of the fetal maturity may also be obtained by examining the ossification centers. So if we visualize the distal femoral epiphysis, it means that the gestational age is roughly around 32 to, 30 to 33 weeks gestation. But you may actually even see this as early as 29 weeks. And remember that this is going to be increasing linearly with the gestational age. Then if we have a distal femoral epiphyseal diameter that's going to be greater than 7 millimeters, this indicates that the gestational age is greater than 37 weeks. It means that the child is mature. Then, of course, if we visualize the proximal tibial epiphysis, this is going to be indicating a gestational age which is at least 35 weeks so this can actually help us estimate whether the child or whether the fetus has actually uh, or the uh, fetus has actually reached the maturity and is able to uh, be delivered so this sonographic detection actually of the proximal humor epiphysis can actually be correlated to mature amniocentesis lung profile so here is a 95% confidence limits for gestational age estimation from the biparietal diameter in the third trimester. For example, if someone has 59 
here millimeters of the bipyrethral diameter then the gestational age in weeks is about 24 weeks so this has a confidence interval of 21.1 to 26.1 days so as you can see this is just a self-explanatory table you can get a screenshot of it and it will help you but no one of course will be expected for you to memorize these values so we can actually combine the methods we can combine the menstrual as well as the ultrasound dates we often do this clinically and we should actually base it upon the 10-day rule or the seven-day rule so when you're using the 10-day rule for example if you get your lmp dates and your ultrasound dates and they agree that within 10 days for example the the LMP gives you that the patient is at 90 days. The ultrasound also gives you that maybe is at 85 days. Then it means that you can go with the LMP days, which are the 90 days. But if the discrepancy is greater than 10 days, then we often use the ultrasound dates. So the rationale behind this is that we want to exclude large errors from incorrect menstrual dates. So we, by using this method, we assume that the menstrual dates are actually much more preferred than the ultrasound dates. But in true essence or in strict Speaking, we're supposed to actually use the ultrasound dates because they are much more accurate. So detailed studies actually have shown that there is uh, there's not any added advantage of using this rule, even though we still do use it because clinically it just helps and it's clinically uh, quite uh, practical. Then of course, unless if the fetus is thought to be actually anatomically abnormal, then the ultrasound dates should be used if the scan in the first half of the pregnancy is present. Then if there's a discrepancy more than seven days between the menstrual and the ultrasound date, we, we should actually look at where the problem is. Maybe the dates were not so sure. Maybe the ultrasound was done quite late. What parameters did they use to determine the gestational age from the ultrasound? So remember that in about 25% of women, there is actually this discrepancy between the menstrual as well as the ultrasound date. And it's actually much more common in obese individuals, those ha that have a BMI greater than 30. And in those who, uh, who have the estimated due date, which is often going to be postponed. And here's a practical guide of what we use on the wards. So generally, the gestational age by the last menstrual period and the gestational age by the ultrasound must agree. So in the first trimester, there should be a discrepancy of about seven days. So seven days, plus or minus one week. In the second trimester, it should be two weeks, plus or minus 14 days. The third trimester, it should be three weeks, plus or minus 21 days. So it means seven day difference between the two in the first trimester, uh, 14 day di difference between the second trimester within 21 days difference in the third trimester. If it's beyond this, then there is a problem somewhere. Then you have to actually look at both of the modalities and see where you could have gone wrong. So what about the date of delivery? This is very important to the practitioner because you would actually educate the pregnant women and you counsel them about when they should expect their children. Often practitioners may put the patient under stress. For example, let me give you a, pra a practical example. A pregnant woman comes, you tell her that the expected date of delivery is on the 3rd of June. Okay, then 3rd of June comes, she doesn't deliver. It's closely approaching to the 10th of June, she still hasn't delivered. How is the woman going to feel? She's going to feel anxious. So remember that in about 4% of the estimations only four percent actually four percent of the total estimations only four four percent of them actually are born on the precise date of estimated date of delivery the bulk majority of them are actually born either two weeks before or one week after so it means that when you're actually giving the date to this woman you should counsel her that this may be two weeks before or one week after so she shouldn't be stressed so this actually for you to do this, you should actually know the median length of a normal pregnancy and the last menstrual period. You should also know the ultrasound estimation of the gestational age. So remember that the median length of the human pregnancy is about 280 days of amenorrhea. So from the first day of the last menstrual period, which is about 40 weeks, then the date of the conceptual age or the conception age is about 20, 266 days. Remember that the estimated date of delivery is going to be estimated via two ways. There's what is known as the Nagel rule and there's what is known as the obstetric wheel. So you can also use some online gestational calculators, which are actually by far much more accurate than both of these two methods. Of course, I don't cover that in this lecture. So using the Nagel's rule, so we assume that the woman has regular cycles and has a certain last menstrual period, and these cycles last for about 28 days. So 
how do we use this rule? We add seven days to the first day of the last menstrual period and nine months. Or alternatively, we can subtract three months and add seven days. So I'll give you an example. Suppose someone has a last menstrual period that was beginning on the 15th of June, 2022. So it means from 15, we add seven. So that would take us to the 22nd. Then from six months, because June is the sixth month, we add nine. But this gives you 15. Remember that there are 12 months in a year. So it means that we have overshot the 12 by three. So it means it should spill over three months into the next year. So this woman is going to give birth on the 22nd of March in 2023. So here's the obstetric wheel. And remember that the quality of these wheels actually varies, but the rule of thumb is that the, the larger the wheel, the, the better the result. So these are actually self-explanatory. All you have to do is just spin. You can actually spin this middle part here. As you can see here is the first day of the last period. So you just simply move this to the day when the person had the period. And then of course you can follow to the date, the current date that you have to determine the gestational age. And of course you can look at also the probable date of birth or the estimated date of delivery and you correlate it to that. Remember that the dates calculated on basis of the last menstrual period are often inaccurate because the time of ovulation can extremely be variable in relation to the occurrence of menses and of course the cycles vary in different women. They vary in the individual woman from cycle to cycle and they have a, a standard deviation of about plus or minus 2.5 days. So there's a tendency towards longer anovulatory cycles and in such women there is errors that we actually get in the estimation of the gestational age and they are actually much more significant in these women. I really hope you enjoyed this lecture on pregnancy dating. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing contents every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.